this reparenting uh, of myself has really come to having those harder conversations with my parents and navigating like where does it all come from? Welcome to the Unapparent Podcast, the place that delivers deeply human stories about the unapparent truths of parenting. My name is Katia Reyero Lindor, and I am your host. Join us as we debunk myths surrounding parenthood and provide an empathetic, judgment-free space for parents and parents to be. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Unapparent Podcast. Today's guest is Genesis. Um, she is a multi-passionate Latina with the determination to empower low-income communities to attain financial freedom through vulnerable storytelling and financial literacy. She specializes in conversations around growing up low income, her experience in corporate America, the importance of an equal partnership, and how she's building wealth by diversifying her income. Genesis' mindset has been instrumental to her success and hopes to continue to inspire women, in particular, that they can have it all, just not at the same time. So thank you, Genesis. Um, that was sort of a brief intro, but is there anything else that you want to add um, or tell us about yourself? That pretty much sums it up. I'm just excited to, to be on the podcast. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, um, another important uh, facet is that Genesis is a mom, like, like um, most of us, I think, listening today. <laughs> so um, you have a toddler, right? Yes, I have a three-and-a-half-year-old. That's very has a very strong personality, as as you'd expect, I think, with any any Latino blood in there. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, my mom could tell you all about me as a toddler. <laughs> so um, I'd say my, my toddler is, um, she's feisty, but um, maybe I'm more on the chill side than perhaps I was. I don't know if she gets that from her dad because he's very calm and collected, but I feel mm. like I'm very, I'm very much an Aries of you know anything about astrology it's just a fire sign so yes. fire i think kind of just um encompasses my personality i love that well um on that note of fire fiery personalities um i always had a hard time controlling my emotions um as a kid and that hasn't necessarily changed as much as I would like, you know, I always thought I'd outgrow it. Um, but if I'm being honest, it's been a constant challenge for me as an adult to kind of self-regulate. And especially now that I am helping another little person self-regulate, while I'm also trying to do the same thing, it's proven to be quite a challenge. Um, so yes, little kids have big feelings and so do adults, but obviously um, being able to self-regulate to in order to help another little person self-regulate is a whole different challenge that I never experienced. Um, is this something that you experience at all in your um, life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess for a little bit of context, uh, yes, I grew up low income. And uh, the main reason for that was because both my my parents immigrated to the US from Bolivia. And at that point, once they were in the United States, they, di they divorced, leaving my mom with three kids to tend to in a foreign country learning a foreign language. And with her being so busy working, that meant there was a lot of time alone, trying to navigate those emotions by ourselves. And I think throughout when I think about my childhood, I think I didn't really allow myself to feel the full emotions because I didn't want to feel I didn't want my mom to think that things were going wrong in addition to all the other things that were actually going wrong. And so I think to a degree, I tried to spare her from those emotions. And although right, that's like super like, wow, that's wonderful for you. That's not what a child needs. And so uh, growing up, I didn't realize I had such an issue with 
regulating my emotions until I got married, which is very inconvenient, to be honest with you, right? Like, there's a lot of maturing that should probably happen before getting married. I got married really young at 19. And thankfully, uh, we're over the hump. But uh, it was something that I had to learn. And I'm still learning how to not speak so quickly, how to uh, not achacar, like place blame on someone else. Um, and it's definitely something that has become very apparent in how I communicate with my son because uh, there, it's interesting because I, once I was – he was he was having, you know, a meltdown and I took him to his room because I want him to know that there's certain spaces that are safe for him to have these meltdowns. Right. Like you typically we, we as adults can have these. I, I literally call them tantrums um, where we're struggling to to regulate our emotions. And so um, but it's really important to know, OK, there's certain place. There's a time and place for it. And we can't be having these tantrums in public like you see a ton of viral videos. Right. Um, but I took him to his room and he's having this like tantrum and just screaming and looking at me and like wanting to hit me, which is very normal um, for a child his age. And I caught my eyes looking at him angrily because, I mean, he, he's making me frustrated, right? And I immediately took a moment to breathe while looking at him and I, and I changed the way that I was looking at him. I softened my gaze and immediately he softened his. And it was such a beautiful learning that comes to mind whenever he's going through a tantrum that in reality he's not there to help regulate my emotions i'm there to help regulate his and i'm his safe space and immediately he truly like became less tense and like allowed me to hug him and so throughout the process of having a child i've really been learning how to self-regulate my emotions because truly i have to and we can't we can't help someone else regulate their emotions if we can't ourselves right yeah and as you say that's um especially when you know our upbringing comes into play with um how we are accustomed to dealing with them or just not dealing with our emotions at all you know that's kind of i think keys having those tools and having that empathy from the person that's your safe space to know that it's not bad to have these big emotions you can have all of the feelings and all the big emotions that you need to have and um and also there is a way to deal with them that's you know more constructive than others um yes and that's just something that teaching a child to do when you yourself are not an expert at it it's like really hard um and for me at least i think this being sent to my room kind of like go to your room and figure it out on your own that was not helpful for me because mm. i didn't know how to self-regulate and that was obviously my problem i was having this tantrum because i'm having big emotions and there's no one there to help me like guide guide me through them and just being yes. sent to my room sort of to like cool off and like think about what i did or said or whatever that was just not helpful because i was just more angry that no one mm -hmm. understood me and that no one was paying attention to like at why I was having these meltdowns or like how I felt. Um, yes. So a big part of what I try to do, even though obviously it's really like you're not going to be perfect as a parent. I, there's times when I lose it with, you know, my mm -hmm. child, even though I always try to come back and repair. That's like the one main thing. I, lo I lost it, but there's always the opportunity to repair um, and just yes. apologize and let them know that um, – you're sorry and that you know just talk it over as if like they understand which they do um so with my daughter at least she feels really bad like immediately she's really empathetic I think and mm -hmm. um like I'll like look at her with a stern look I try not to be like super angry and whatever but there's times when I am um and she'll immediately like feel bad for hitting me or whatever it was that she did and then she'll want to hug and I will never deny that for her because that's probably <laughs> what, if I could have expressed what I needed at 
the time when I was her age, I probably would have asked for a hug too. I probably would have been like, I just need a hug from my mom um, or my dad or whoever was there. And um, yeah, I just, I gave her a hug and that immediately softens me too. Like if I was mad, it just, that like melts away (laughs) because it's like so sweet. And of course I'll give you a hug and we will learn together how to do this because I'm not an expert um, by any means. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, And so going back to, you said your upbringing, um, I'm guessing your mom worked a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you think that her emotional availability or lack thereof um, played a part in um, what we're talking about, right? You as a child and the struggles you had um, learning to regulate your own emotions? Whew, this feels like therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm like, not a ther- I don't mean for that. To be <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think in the best way, you know, like mm-hmm. um, they're hard, com- they're hard topics uh, that show up. But mm-hmm. uh, so something that I've, I've learned throughout going and actually seeing a therapist, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is detrimental to uncovering what our inner child faces I've learned that I struggle with anxious attachment, right? And so I think a lot of a lot of the uh, reparenting is made is brought to our awareness because of something that we're facing as adults. So, for example, I found myself like I'm a pretty independent person, but I found myself uh, being very anxiously attached to my husband, <laughs> and what that means, right? There's different types of attachment and. Uh, he is, um, I'm anxious attachment. He's avoidant, meaning if there's uh, something that arises, I'm mm-hmm. running toward him, trying to fix it and asking for validation. Like, Hey, you still love me. Like we're still here. We're still good. You know, versus him. He's like, I want to run a- as fast as f- fast as I possibly can from you. Mm-hmm. And, um, which isn't, doesn't work. Right. <laughs> and so, Uh, When I was talking to my therapist, um, just in many conversations, I was trying to understand this. And I found out that the reason why I was feeling these things, these emotions, is primarily because I felt abandoned by my father. So I had a very negative association with men subconsciously. And I also, at first, uh, I was like, oh, maybe it's just my father. But I think it was my mother, too. And as I opened up and shared this with my mom, she shared with me that early on, I saw that she would give attention to my younger brother, who, like, I when I was two, he was, like, born, right? And so at that age, you uh, are so used to your mom giving you all the attention possible. And so she she noticed that I would start to reject her love. And as a result of that rejection, she thought, oh, maybe she's just not like a touchy person. She just doesn't really like like want me to hug her or or play with her. And I started giving attention to uh, the maid when um, when I needed I needed more attention. Right. Like in care. And so my mom saw that as rejection and and thereby started rejecting me and so it's kind of this this really weird thing to think about right and I think my mom too she she was struggling with so much after my parents divorce that really I mean I, I I'll never blame my parents for anything that they've done I think it's you, you do the best that you can with the information that you have and so this reparenting uh of myself has really come to having those harder conversations with my parents and navigating like where does it all come from because i think the first step truly is like giving it a name and that has been instrumental to to my success in in reparenting my brain oh so good thank you um thank you for sharing that yeah um I, my parents aren't divorced, um, and I come from a, a pretty, you know, loving relationship, you know, example. So, um, I guess we differ in, in that respect, but I think mm-hmm. the, when as parents, we're just so overwhelmed and busy with 
whatever it is, you know, whether it's personal, like, you know, a divorce and work and having multiple children and all of these things. Um, it is really hard to be available in the ways your child needs for you to be available. Right. Um, and then lack of awareness of that is just a big one. Um, our parents probably grew up in a different time where the access to information wasn't as readily available. Um, they're you know also the the being low income it's like well they don't have a choice they've just they've got to do it all themselves and they've just got to mm -hmm. figure it out and do the best they can as you said with with what they've got um and so maybe all of those lacks not that again like you I wouldn't you know blame them um I think I had an amazing childhood and upbringing and I um there's so many good things that they did um yeah. but it's I I think now to like the kind of mom my mom was you know where she did so much she was just constantly busy I cannot imagine being emotionally available for a child who needed so much like emotional um just regulating that I needed mm -hmm. you know yeah with what mental space was she going to do that really you know she had two other kids I was the youngest she had two other children who were small she homeschooled us you know she cooked a bunch of meals a day she like drove everyone here and there and you know she had a husband so she was also being you know a wife and mother and so many things that I'm like I I'm exhausted just thinking about all of that so I'm like how would I have had you know the emotional availability to be there for my child and when they needed that you know so I don't blame her Absolutely. but all of this to say having that awareness you know, I sometimes feel shame around the privilege that I have now to give my daughter where, you know, I'm able to give her time and um, just a, lo a lot of things I didn't have. And I, and I, you know, I can, if I need to afford help, I could do that so that I have more time with her and, you know, and someone else could like cook for me or clean for me and do all these things that I saw my mom doing herself, right? So there's a lot of shame attached to like the privilege I now have. But interestingly enough, I'm trying. I'm like I'm in therapy as well, right? And um, I'm just trying to find ways for me to feel that this is. I don't have to be the same parent my mom was, you know. And I want to be emotionally available to my child, and I want to be there for when they have big emotions, and and not be so mentally drained from doing all of these other things that I just can't even like give them a time of day when they're having a tantrum, you know, or I'm just like, Shh, go to your room, you know, like deal with it yourself. Um, so all these things tie into just how then do I have conversations later on with my child about privilege? Um, because I didn't grow up with these things, right? And in a way, it's like it was simpler because I just learned to be humble because that was what our life was, you know? I didn't have to be taught that necessarily. Um, I think also it has to do with the parents. My, mom, my parents are incredibly humble and um, just great role models. But I don't know, is this something that you have thought of or, or, or struggle with um, coming up with answers to um, how to teach your child about certain privileges that you didn't have growing up? Yeah, yeah, I definitely I definitely think about this. It, I I think what you said about shame when you, let's say you you now live um a better life, let's say if you're thinking like financially, um mm -hmm. if we could narrow it down to that. Um I think it's very relatable. I think a lot of people feel that shame. And to that I say uh you'd actually, I feel like you should feel more shame if you were still in that same position that you're, that you were with your parents, right? Because they quite literally sacrificed as much as they possibly could so that you would be in a better off position. And so whenever I do feel shame around that, I think, no, like this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. This is what, what my mom wanted for me, what my dad wanted for me. Um, and so that's how I, I, I get rid of that shame. But as for the privilege, I really hope not to be the parent that's always like, well, when I was your age, you know, like <laughs> all those things that I feel like most most parents probably probably share. Mm -hmm. I really believe in leading by example. Mm -hmm. And so that's being like I love 
uh, in Japanese culture, it's very common uh, to uh, leave things better off than how you found them. And that's something that I've been really trying to incorporate into our family. Um, and so like picking things up off the ground, if you see them and like trash or whatever it may be, unless it's mm-hmm. like, you know, you got also got to be mindful because toddlers will pick up anything. Um, <laughs> but right. So uh, but in in that sense, that's something that uh, we is is a big value of mine. And then I don't want to buy him whatever he wants. Uh Primarily because I don't believe in in things like materialism. Overconsumption, um, yeah. Yes, I'm like very much against that. And uh, to really be able to like love the things that you have and learn creative ways to make them what you want them to be. Mm-hmm. And so that's really important to me. Um, it's very easy to, to want to buy and buy and buy, but at the end of the day, no, no. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. also just show, showcasing like a lot of gratitude within our family and having open conversations with our son. So for example, he's seen me, he's seen me cry. Right. Um, I think that's inevitable, but he's seen me cry and he's like, um, he'll come up to me and he'll ask me, mama, que pasó? right. He'll ask me what, what happened. And, uh, I'll immediately tell him like, mom, mom's a little sad right now. Like, and I'll explain to him what happened. Or the opposite, I'll tell him like why I'm so happy or um, that mom and mom and dad really love each other and like things like that. Um, So I think just having open conversations about everything that's going on, um, everything that we see, even, you know, there's it's interesting. I think I saw a video somewhere that like toddlers, when they see people like homeless people or um, Mm -hmm. just people that are behaving differently in public. It's even teaching them about like the like how you respond to other people's behavior. And um, so I think transparency is another big value of mine. And I think that just throughout him growing up, even to this day, like I he really respects actually like he's he's extremely obedient and I don't know what I'm doing right (laughs) or what my husband's doing right. But like he asks questions and. I want to encourage that. And I think leading by example is going to be the only way for him to understand, wow, the things that I have, that's all I need. And I think uh, not desiring more is a big part of humility. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100 percent. And um, a lot of the things you said do remind me of um, sort of how I learned um, to be the way I am, my my mom was really big on also like leaving the world better than you know we found it kind of um thing. Even though she never explicitly used those words necessarily, mm-hmm. um or maybe she did. I don't remember that, but it was more so like the acts, you know, like picking up trash every time you'd go to the mm-hmm. beach or go out, and um, you know, like just because other people aren't you know doing their part doesn't mean we shouldn't, and actually means we should more so <laughs> because we know better and we want to do better. Um and and I just just learned that. F- by her example right um and so i think you're right that is a a big one and the best way to teach children definitely is by example um because that's the way you know they learn i guess you can say things over and over and over and over and it may or may not stick but when they see you doing it it's kind of like oh yeah you know i want to you it's like kind of being their role model um and that is that's the best way to do it um yeah yeah What's what's interesting is actually the other day I noticed uh, we were like getting ready to go out or something and I saw him. He was like, oh, oh, OK, uh, clean up, clean up. Like he was saying like 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 he then he suddenly like runs over to his room and starts tidying up because like that's what he sees us do. Right. What Before mm-hmm. we're going to go out, we're going to clean the dishes. We're going to kind of tidy up the house so that when we come back, it's better than how it was initially. And so, yes, the example piece is so beautiful because I see it in him all the time. And 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 that right there, the cleanliness, his his future wife will thank me. One hundred percent. Yeah. My mom always <laughs> joked with me about how I'm not like the most organized person, even though I cannot tell you how many times like she repeated the organization, the, you know, I mean, I'm not like, I'm, I, I think I like things to be clean, but I don't yes. necessarily need them to be like super tidy. Um, 
well that was back then you know now i'm like with a kid and i see like a mess and i'm like oh no this no yes. i need i need to fix this right um but <laughs> my my husband and i we we sort of like you know it's like we live together and it works because we both get to a point where like okay we need to like tie this up and like we'll do it together right because it's, it's not like i'm not type a he's not type a by any means um so like we can live in sort of some disorganization and it works for yes. us because it's like i'm sure if i were type a that would drive me nuts and vice versa um but like we both get to a point where we either kind of look at each other and we're like it's kind of messy like we kind of have to yeah. like, you know <laughs> do this tie this yes. tidy this room up um and my daughter she's very good about that if you know like she's very much like a helper if she sees me doing something she wants to like help you know she's like oh i'll help you and she like puts her things her little toys away and i'm like yeah that was not me when i was your age but <laughs> i was also hard-headed everything my mom said i wanted to do I the opposite that. of so yeah um there's that too <laughs> um I love that. and so you live um in the u.s right so mm-hmm. you grew up in the u.s correct your yes. parents immigrated yes. before you were born yes i was born in illinois okay. Okay. Um, and I think for me, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, right? Um, so I'll speak mm-hmm. from my um, experience, even though technically we're, you know, we're not immigrants, we're, we're U.S. citizens. Um, yeah, the culture yeah. is different and there is that cultural difference yes. living in the U.S. and the mainland versus um, Puerto Rico. And um, it's not something I like necessarily actively think about, like, embedding you know our heritage into our daughter because it's just it's in her blood you know kind of Mm -hmm. um very much so it's in her blood but um it's we've always spoken spanish to her because that's important for us for her to you know learn spanish and kind of stay true to her her roots even though she was born in the u.s and lives here um so beyond prioritizing the language right is Mm -hmm. there anything you find of value in um, imparting, like, the cultural heritage in in your child? Um, Or is that something that you just don't really think about either? I definitely think about it. I think there's there's a reason why I named him Benicio. Um, (laughs) And I think my husband was definitely hesitant. Um, For context, my husband is white. And he was just hesitant, like, oh, my gosh, people are just going to, like, not know how to pronounce it. Then we're going to have to clarify all the time. And I'm like... The only way that people are ever going to learn is if you educate them. And so my, I named him Benicio because he is literally our blessing because we were, we're, we've struggled with infertility. And that was really important to me. When I heard the name, I was like, that's his name. And I couldn't shake it off. And so name is very important. And Benicio, you can say Ben or Benny. And sometimes people will like my husband will be like, Oh, you can call him Benny. And I, 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 I like to joke. And so sometimes I'll be like, well, it's not really why I named him the what, what, like what I named him. And so um, I'll say Benicio and I'll just help people kind of you, I, I don't want to say correct because it's like they're just learning, um, but I'll just help them along the process. So name is definitely um, a way that I do that. And then another way that I incorporate culture into his life is he has a really strong relationship with his grandmother, uh, my mom. And like she taught him how to drink the cito, like tea with bread, you know, which is like super common. Um, and like he knows how to throw in like the crunchy, like uh, bread into the, the tea to like, so that it soaks and then like take, pick it up with his spoon. And so, um, something like that, that seems like so minor, um, but is actually like a really beautiful thing. And then food, I think like most cultural cult- cultures is him knowing what these different foods taste like. So we really incorporate a lot of plantains into what we eat. Um, my husband makes all different types of, uh, Latino, uh, inspired like meals. So ropa vieja is like a staple in our home. Um, empanadas are a staple, salteñas, which is very like Bolivian slash Argentine. Um, so food is definitely another way that we definitely incorporate culture. And food really brings people together. So what better way, <laughs> <Yeah>. honestly? <laughs> um, honestly. So, I mean, he cooks all these, you know, cuisines, right? So that's awesome. Yeah. Good for yeah, him. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. cool. It's 
honestly, that's, that's something that's kind of unique about my, our relationship, our partnership is that, um, traditionally, right. It's the man that works. It's the man mm-hmm. that, um, will come home to, to home cooked meal or whatever it is. Uh, it's the woman that cleans, that takes care of the children. And for us, it's, it's very, uh, much not that traditional, um, we found early on that actually he's really good at cooking and he enjoys it significantly more than I do. And I'm really good at cleaning. I can clean like an entire house in like 30 minutes or less. Um, and I'm also really good at working. Like I just, I guess corporate America is, I, I, I can handle that. Right. And mm-hmm. um, it's just been really neat to see how we leverage our strengths so that we can really have like a very wholesome partnership yeah which is what it's all about so i mean i commend you on that even though it seems intuitively like what makes sense like why would you be so gendered in our roles right yes (laughs) tradition doesn't necessarily um benefit us but that's awesome and and i'm glad you brought that up because it's also such a big like especially in, in latino culture right like women are accustomed to being as you say, the cooks, the ones who clean, the ones who raise the children. Um, And that might actually feel fulfilling to some people, and Mm -hmm. that's fine, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, But then when it's kind of like more of an expectation than like what actually feels good and right, then that becomes kind of where you're – you're not satisfied because it's like you're a full person. You're a full human with potential and other – things that maybe you want and just because you're um a mother and a a housewife right housewife doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that that's the only thing right that you're good to do right um and so this sounds really like antiquated um but it still is sort of the norm in a lot of households and as i said if that works that's great but if it doesn't it it doesn't mean that like it it, like women are i feel like we can never get it right right because if we go work we are living our kids in daycare or whatever (laughs) we're we're not being doing our job, you know. And yeah. if we stay home and don't work, it's like, oh, well, what are you doing to like help your husband like bring you know money into the house? So yeah. it's like yeah, yeah. there's nothing that we can do <laughs> ever again that will get it right, you know, according to society. So I say f all of those like you know expectations and gender norms, and it's like do whatever yes. works for you. And especially if you have a partner who's you know supportive and that he can pick up some of those like roles that traditionally women have to do it's like leaves your room to kind of just leverage as you say your strengths and just do whatever works absolutely love that yeah well I struggle with also um like I'm not actively like I'm not out working um like a job um Mm -hmm. but my husband travels a lot and um Mm -hmm. so I am left to kind of raise you know kids um alone part of the time you know i have my sister yes. helping me but um it's it is very much draining um emotionally mentally um you know physically and his job is draining and it's like well we sort of uh, the season we're in you know i don't know if they're once mm-hmm. they're older if there's something that i may want to go out and do on my you know on my own for me um mm-hmm. But in the meantime, I keep reminding myself and I would like to remind all of those mothers who may feel like me that this is, you know, a season. I think the most demanding time is when the kids are this small that you have to dedicate Mm -hmm. so much, you know, like time and energy to them. Um, And I am, you know, blessed I can afford to stay home. Um, It's just I know that there is so much that I want to do also that it's not necessarily Mm -hmm. like, oh, this is forevermore what I want my life to be like, who knows? But um, yeah, it's definitely inspiring when um, women like you, like you, you know, they can they find a way to kind of be fulfilled in other aspects as well, uh, other than being a you know a present parent, also a professional, and I'm mm-hmm. sure all the other things that you have in your life. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot to to handle, right? Because the mom job never stops, um, but the other jobs mm-hmm. do. And so it's a lot of balancing and it's not easy. I'll never pretend that it's easy because even recently I've been feeling like, oh, like I've been really distracted lately. I want to be more uh, present when I'm with my son. Right. And so you have you go through this journey 
um, ebbs and flows for sure. But I think that I knew that I couldn't be a stay at home mom, um, because I went through postpartum depression. And so Mm -hmm. as soon as I started working, I just, that it significantly improved my mood. And so, um, I think it's just, yeah, understanding what is going to be work for you, what, what kind of support systems you have, because if my husband was gung ho about working full time and all that jazz, maybe we'd consider like living closer to my mom and uh, we'd have to reevaluate what our priorities are and what we're willing to shift in order to ha- have those priorities met. Right. Yeah, 100%. And I totally get the whole postpartum stage. Um, That's where that's why my podcast was created. I needed I think that passion project that even it wasn't Mm -hmm. a job per se, it was something Mm -hmm. that like fulfilled me outside of my role as a mom and and wife and um, everything else. So it's, I think, really important to have something that you can do for you that fulfills you that kind of lights that that fire inside and reminds you that yeah, you're this complete person um you know your mom and your wife and all of these things but you're also an individual um and and fulfilling that that part of you is um it's important especially to um i guess get past that postpartum stage for me that was really really um a key discovery that i needed um so totally commend you and as you say just your priorities shift according to what they are and what your resources mm-hmm. are and what your support system looks like. So, um, yeah, that was a great point. Um, well, Genesis, I know you're very busy and, um, I really appreciate your time for, um, for coming on the show and talking about your experiences and being vulnerable with us today. Um, so before I let you go, could you tell us, um, how to find you on social media if people want to follow i know you have a lot of really cool um tips on income and all of things you share i really enjoy so you can share for my followers to find you yes i would love i would love to connect with you all so you can find me on tiktok and instagram as genuinely genesis my content uh revolves everything we've talked about today primarily financial transparency content and uh just transparency overall it's uh when i when i came up with a name i asked my friend i was like hey what should my instagram be called she was like i feel like you're really genuine i was like dope let's do it genuinely (laughs) genesis so anyway that's where you can find me and please uh send me a dm and uh let me know how you found me through through katya's podcast uh, and i look forward to meeting you there awesome well thank you genesis thank you for having me Gracias, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Unapparent Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe as we release a new episode at least every month with an exciting new guest. Be sure to also follow us on Instagram for all the Unapparent content you never knew you needed.